You're listening to a podcast from the Abbey Theatre's Oral History Project. For more information about the archive, visit abbeytheatre.ie. In this podcast, we hear playwrights, directors and members of the former Abbey Theatre Acting Company speaking about their beginnings in theatre in the 1950s and 60s. For playwright Thomas Kilroy, his first introduction to theatre was at school in Kilkenny. The background contact with theatre for me was the, the world of the fit-ups and um, of touring companies, uh, Anya McMaster being the obvious, obvious one. So this individual arrived with the dyed hair and the day makeup and the uh, extravagant costume. <laughs> and sat on a chair in front of the class. And the, the only way I can describe it to you is that he took us through Hamlet uh, in a mixture of kind of commentary and acting parts, uh, you know, uh, a doddery Polonius and a simpering <laughs> Ophelia. It was wonderful. Um, um, but he took us through the play in great detail. And it was my first contact with great acting because I was sitting just a few yards away from him. And um, he, had, he had to control unruly school boys who found him funny, you know, and he did control them. Um, but uh, that kind of experience of, of uh, meeting theatre and the raw, as it were, had a huge effect upon me, I think. The touring fit-up companies of the 1950s also paved the way for actor Derry Power who joined the Abbey Theatre in 1955. Well, how I came to the Abbey. Uh, I, I, I come from Yall in County Cork. I was acting as an amateur, and in those days you could become a professional actor by answering an ad in the paper. People would advertise in The Independent. They had a, a stage column. And we, sometimes you would see act, actual wanted something. Good amateur might suit. So I was the amateur, whether I was good or bad or another thing. So I, I, I joined, I answered one of these ads and joined a company and uh, toured around North Cork and, and, and Limerick in the, what year was it? I'd say it was 53. James Robertson's company, who was a Scottish gentleman. And I joined on a Saturday, and on Sunday I played a detective. I'm five foot four now, so playing a detective without any rehearsal. Then that was Sunday. Then Monday I played in a different play, Tuesday a different play, and for the week it was a different play. Uh, and, and we toured, uh, and that was with the, with the fit-ups. Uh, so then I joined another company, which was a bit more upmarket. And I toured for the whole uh, next year then. Then I came to Dublin to seek my fortune, which I still haven't sulk. And um, I, then I then auditioned for the Abbey for Mr. Blythe and Rhea Mooney. And they were doing a Gaelic play for Patrick's Night by Sean Atum, I think. Gonna come a slower or something like that. Uh, so I, I, I was playing in Dunleary at the time with the Globe, and I got out of the play in the Globe for three nights to play in the Abbey in Osgoelga. So I did that, and after then I pestered Blythe again, and I, I think he, he then took me into the company. So that was the, the spring of 55. For some, the Irish language was a route to the stage. Ronnie Masterson's fluency in Irish brought it to the attention of the Abbey Theatre Managing Director Ernest Blythe in 1944. Yeah, so that's how I met Ernest Blythe the first time. And it, it was just, it was, a, it was a competition for an Irish speaker, that's mm. all, you know. And he was the adjudicator. I didn't know who he was or anything else like that, you know. But he became very interested and when he realised I had such very good Irish, he told me that he now had Irish speaking school in the Abbey and he would like me to come into the Irish school and that he wouldn't charge me anything. 
Kind of nice. I think my poor mother felt, well, I'd like to feel you had something to fall back on. And a, a thing came up about uh, an exam for getting into one of these things, you know. And <laughs> I had three months of three nights a week at night time. And in that time, I went twice. The rest of the times, they thought I was at it, but I was standing at the back of the abbey. But, uh, I mean, I didn't want to say to them, I'm not going, like, you know. But I knew where I wanted to be. <laughs> Actors Kathleen Barrington, Pat Laffin and Des Cave were all contemporaries as young actors at the Abbey Theatre in the 1960s. And strangely, I was really interested in acting from the time I was a tiny little tot. One of my first memories is standing on the dining room table, reciting a poem from my aunts who were teachers over from England. I think I might have been about four, but always great interest in doing things, acting. I remember there were a group of us and as an excuse for a party, we used to put on a show. So there were the Barringtons, the Margies next door, the Monks down the road, and Nuala O'Carroll. And we used to put a show together. The Margies were very good at ballet. They both learned ballet. Uh, Nuala was good at Irish dancing, and I was in charge of whatever sort of play or whatever we put on. And we'd have them in the drawing room, and we had folding doors in the drawing room. So we'd pull back the folding doors, and we would present our little show. And when I was very young, my mother remembered her older brother having the marks of the bars of the upper circle in the Abbey Theatre engraved on his forehead. He went there so often to see the plays. And he knew the plays by heart, and she was able to say some of the lines. And that would be the very early days. I mean, it would be, like, be 1903 or four, a bit, little, little bit later than that, perhaps. I think I might have decided I had to be an actor then, really, uh, because <laughs> I, was, uh, I was made perform at school recitations at the National School uh, by... Uh, coached by my mother and um, then I went to boarding school and I was persuaded to be in Gilbert and Sullivan shows but all the time I was never going to be anything else ever at all well in UCD I joined Dramsock my second year got conferred on a Wednesday in UCD and the following week I auditioned in the Abbey and Ria Mooney was there and uh, Mr. Blythe was there, and you had to do a bit, a bit of O'Casey and a bit in Irish, and something else, and that was that was it. And he said "Genation," and I didn't, you know, I didn't even know what that meant, which meant finish. And a note from Blythe saying that they liked my audition, and I'd better get in there and rehearse and be on the stage the following Monday night. So that was that. When I always thought that my first, my very first feeling for the theatre was the experience of serving mass. When I was an altar boy, it had all the thing of moving up and answering the priest and you were doing it on behalf of the congregation and it was all that feeling of being, mm, you know, you're doing your stuff. And my mother happened to be reading the paper and she saw that, uh, oh, she said, I see the, the Abbey School of Acting is starting up again. And I said, wow, where? I didn't see that. No, it's in the Evening Herald, but it's all in Irish. The advertisement is Oscailge, which I wasn't too... She was better than me. And I applied for that. And Bill Foley, I hope, I think, I'm sure, put in a word for me. Mm -hmm. So I went for an audition and uh, got into the school. Frank Dermody okay. and Ernest Blythe. The two of them were in. The, they, they, they vetted everybody. And uh, I just did my piece, I did the piece from the play by which I'd already done, mm -hmm. then I had brushed up on, a, on, a, on, a, on another a piece, and then I did a little piece in Gaelic, and Blythe just said, all he said was, Kenny Stitt, how old are you? And I said, 19. Ah, oh, So, 
that was, and then we were, we you got, got the letter in the post. I, I used to have it from his secretary, Maureen McCormack, the actual little card with the Abbey logo on it to say, you have been accepted to the Abbey School of Acting, the Abbey School of Acting. Please attend April so-and-so for the first, uh, first class. As a student in Queen's University, Belfast, Stephen Ray had long been interested in the venerable institution of the National Theatre. He talks here with actor Niall Buggy. I had the high-minded thing too. I probably had more of a high-minded thing than people who lived in Dublin because it was just the Abbey was down the street. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas for me it was a significant institution and I'd read all about Yeats and the, the formation of the theatre and it was, I considered it extremely important, you know, and rather wonderful that there was a national theatre before there was yes. a nation, you know, and I think that's probably the right order, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and um, so I knew all about that because I was fascinated with the theatre and then I did Yeats at, uh, at university and I, all I did was read about his career in the theatre yeah. and starting the, this place and I, I was you know, deeply fascinated by the whole revival of the, you know, 1904. And uh, absolutely. I was totally yeah. fascinated by it. So that's why I thought I would give that a go. Uh, well, I actually had been in uh, the Brendan Smith Academy. I think I was about 14 years of age. And this was an academy that existed in Camden Street, uh, run by a man called Brendan Smith. But I, was, uh, um, I went there on a Saturday afternoon, so I was, a, you know, because I was a child, really. And then, as far as I remember, the Abbey were looking for people to do some crowd work. And uh, I got into the Abbey School through that. And myself, Sinead Cusack, and Frank Grimes, and Niall O'Brien. Um, and so that was at the Queen's. And it was crowd work for, for um, Galileo, which was a production by Tomás McCanna. That was my fir first time in the Abbey. But I, I didn't become a member of the company for quite a number of years, although I was being employed uh, constantly uh, uh, and, and playing leading roles uh, by the time I was 17 in, in the Abbey, in the new Abbey, so to speak. And um, then John Kavanagh said he was going to go up to the office and ask for a, a pay rise or to become a member. And I said, oh, I would, would you ask for me as well? And that's what happened. And that's how I became a member of the Abbey. So John Kavanagh is the reason. Actor and writer Eamon Morrissey never became a member of the Abbey Theatre Company, but he has performed frequently on both the Abbey and Peacock stages. Here he describes the impact on him of an early production at the Queen's. Actually, the, there was a moment when I decided I wanted to be an actor. And that moment was actually took place in the Abbey. And now I can't remember. I imagine I was 12, 13, but I could have been a couple of years old, you know. But my mother, we, we went to, it was a production of um, uh, Plough of the Stars. Not only did, it was good, it was a good Abbey production of it. Obviously, it must have been in the Queens in those days. I, it was yes, and um, I just loved it. But something else happened to me. As I sat there, I realised it was enough. It wasn't enough to be sitting in the audience. I wanted to be up on that stage doing it. Um, and out of that, I think I remember Vincent Dowling was playing the Covey in in it, and Philip O'Flynn was was. Uh, What's his face? Fluth or maybe I don't know. But it, I, I just loved it. And really from that moment on, I knew where I wanted to be. Um, so that's really it. What the, the Abbey had an influence on me. I didn't even finish my last year in Sing Street, you know. I got a job as stage manager of Playboy the Western World in 1960 with Siobhan McKenna, Donald Donnelly, and a lot of the older uh, uh, Abbey actors like Brian O'Higgins and... Um, it, that was the start of my, my career. We went off on a European, a huge European tour. And naturally, I thought theatre was always going to be like that, but I very quickly learned otherwise. Um, but, no, for, but to go into the theatre was quite, to, was quite a... You were leaving proper society. You really were. You were becoming some kind of a bohemian, you know. And my parents, very nicely, when I 
decided on it, kind of accepted it. I mean, I should have been going somewhere like the New Ireland Insurance, or, or I was also tipped for Irish shipping, and I, ironically, both those companies had gone wallop in between. Maureen Igronia's introduction to the stage came through teacher training college with some very impressive drama tutors. And I went to national school there, secondary school presentation convent, and nat natural pro progression after that was Kerry's first training college, where I met Tomás Mokana, the artistic director of the Abbey for many, many years. And that's how I became interested in acting. I had done school musicals, which I adored. And while I was in, in Carysford in the year 1962, the summer of 1962, uh, there had been an, there was an organisation, there still is an organisation called Kogo Noshunta Nagoya, which is to help promotion promotion of Irish language and especially for for young teachers. So they had um, a scholarship program for the summer for in teachers to get acquainted with theatre and how theatre works, in order to be able to teach Goilge through drama, which was a wonderful idea, absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's often been done, but they were actually putting money where their mouth was. And these, uh, this was conducted by Tomás McConnell from the Abbey and uh, Princess Mokjev, the other Frank, Frank Germany, also of the Abbey. So you got the, the highest in the land at the time who taught us everything from how to paint uh, sets to prompting, to playing, to reading parts, to playing parts, to make up, all of that in four weeks in Guidor in County Donegal. Anyway, 64 I was teaching and I heard that the Moss McConnell was doing a show in the Damer and the, an Irish show, it was, turned out to be Maureen Nigrodas on Trio. So I went out to the bus stop and said, I'm going to go down and see something there. And I, as I stood at the bus stop, the Moss McConnell pulls up and said, Nigrodas, do you want a part in on Trio? And I said, yes, I was just going down to get a part in Trio. And he said, right, here you come. So off we went. I got a part in Thrill, which became one that was 1964. It became a big hit. It was the same year as Eugene McCabe's uh, The King of the Castle and Brian Friel's Philadelphia, Here I Come. It was a wonderful festival. Director and former artistic director Patrick Mason first became aware of the Abbey Theatre during his education in England. And we were sent to Catholic boarding schools, the boys, to the monks, to the Benedictine monks uh, at... Uh, Ramsgate, that was a Benedictines of the primitive order, who were quite as ferocious as they sound, and then to the English community of Benedictines at Downside, which is St Gregory's College in Somerset, between Bath and Wells, a really beautiful part of the country actually, and uh, there uh, a much more uh, cultured and worldly education uh, took place, including my first introduction to the Abbey Theatre because there was a monk in the community called Don Woolston Philipson, who claimed credibly to have had an association with the Abbey, with the old Abbey. Indeed, it turned out he was Cyril Cusack's spiritual director. And Don Woolston used to do productions of Abbey plays, um, The Pot of Broth, Kathleen the Houlihan, The Land of Heart's Desire, in the summer term and the spring term, up in the monastery gardens. And one of the more surreal elements of this sort of uh, English Catholic education of the professional and upper middle classes was to hear these very brittle uh, Anglo accents roaring out the lines <laughs> of Yeats and Singh in the monastery shrubbery. Uh, <laughs> And this was my first introduction to the Abbey Theatre. Many members of the Abbey Theatre Acting Company started out as stage managers. Here, actor Brigny Nocton describes her first meeting with director Tomás McConaughey and her first job as an acting assistant stage manager. So I wrote to then artistic director Tomás McConaughey and um, he wrote back and said, can you come up? I remember distinctly sitting in the Abbey foyer uh, and he was to meet me at half one because he was re rehearsing. So I was sitting there and all the members of the Abbey Company were coming down the stairs and, and you know, you kind of went, oh my God, you know. So I uh, met him and he said, yes, uh, I need an ASM and uh, uh, can you start 
like in two weeks' time. So that's how I started. So I came up, I had nowhere to stay. <laughs> My mother came up with me. We, we kind of traipsed around trying to find a, a flat or a thing. So I found a tiny little place uh, in uh, Leinster Square and um, started in the Abbey. And I think my first um, ASM was... The Devil of Saint would be. Yeah. Uh, at the time, there were only two ASMs in the Abbey. So you went from, you did an Abbey production, you did a Peacock production, you did an Abbey production, a Peacock production. So you kind of, you went from show to show. I worked with Rona Woodcock and Bill Hay and they told you this is what you do. You set up your props, you do the thing, you look after the actors and stuff and you sat in rehearsals. And uh, I had told the Moss McConnell that I was interested in acting. So it was kind of, I was coming in as an acting ASM. And at the time, if there if there was a line or a, you know a small part or something, you did you you set up you did your your, your ASM work, and then if you had a line to say, you'd go on, you'd, you'd get into your costume, you'd say your line, you'd come back, and you'd you go back to your ASMing. So really, no, I didn't have any training, uh, but but I just learnt on the job. I found it fantastic. I found it fantastic at the time. I wasn't aware of it. Do you know what I mean? I wasn't aware of how much I was taking because you were on the you were in the rehearsal room. You were in with the actors. You were sitting there. You watched people, you know, uh, you know, from day one, from the first reading right up to performance. So, uh, oh, it, it was fantastic. We finish with playwright Bernard Farr recounting his first excursions to the Abbey Theatre at the Queen's. His mother would always bring a picnic of sandwiches and tea along. And with all of this stuff, we used to get on a bus out in Dunleary and come into Dublin and maybe to the Queen's, whatever theatre it was, and I'm sure we were known all over the place as the family who used to come in and wouldn't wait until the interval to eat anything. But halfway through at the first act, my mother would decide um, the children must be hungry about now. And she used to perform this trick, which was absolutely wonderful. Well, actually, it was so embarrassing to see, but it'd be wonderful if you were a fly on the wall. She used to never, her, her eyes would never leave the stage. So it didn't look as if her arms and her body belonged to her. They were doing things that she was unaware of. And within the, this, she used to reach down and she used to pick out of her bag the flask of tea and there would be this squeaky noise and everybody around the place would be all going, what is that? Is that part of the play? Or are we supposed to think <laughs> there's a door opening slowly somewhere? She would squeak this and she would be watching it as well as if she was kind of surprised that was this noise as well. And she would open this and then she would leach down and she would get a cup and she would fill the cup and I don't know how she knew <laughs> it was three quarters full, but it was full. And then she would pass that along to us and we used to be thinking, for Christ's sake, don't be pouring our tea in the middle. And everybody around would be all getting a bit shirty, you know, wondering, what is all this moving around? And then all the tea would be passed down, we'd all have our tea like this. And then she would take out the bundles of sandwiches in the greaseproof paper with the two elastic bands. The two elastic bands would be taken off with a bing and a bong, you know. And then this would be unwrapped like thunder, passed along to us, and we'd all have it. Always and ever, when we reach that, you would think that peace would settle now. Always and ever, the, the whisper would come up from Father me or my two sisters, or my father, back to her, I have chicken sandwiches, I wanted banana sandwiches. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this podcast from the Abbey Theatre's Oral History Project. For more information about the archive, visit abbeytheatre.ie.